I was frustrated seeing all the waste that I was seeing in meat prep and restaurants. My great grandpa used to go and inspect the scrap buckets at the end of the day in the cut room and sort of hold them up and say like, this could have been fajitas, this could have been this and that. <laughs> Listening to the Taste Podcast. I'm editor in chief Matt Rodbard here with senior editor Anna Hazel. Today on the show, Matt catches up with Cara Nicoletti, a fourth generation butcher, writer, and co founder of the vegetable centric sausage company Seymour. Yeah, and I love these sausages. I've 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 bought them for friends and family, and they're cool because there's a lot of vegetables in them, more than the average sausage. Though there's meat as well, so it's a really cool kind of blending of meat and vegetables. We also talk about her work at the Meat Hook in Brooklyn and how eventually she disrupted the sausage game. Did she tell you about how the sausage gets made? Yes, Anna, I wrote that joke for you, and you delivered it quite well. During our conversation, we certainly make many of those how the sausages are made jokes, but we also talked about butcher shops and how you can tell if a butcher shop is quality or not by walking in. Here's Matt with Cara Nicoletti. And make sure to visit tastecooking.com for our latest stories and recipes and to sign up for our newsletters, which drop on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Cara Nicoletti, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I've wanted to talk to you for a, for a hot minute ever since I received your hot sausages <laughs> in the mail. Thank you for that. What's yes. your newest? What's your favorite flavor right now? So I think my favorite fl- flavor right now is we just released a chili verde sausage, um, which is you know based on like a Mexican style green chorizo. It's our first really really spicy flavor. Um, it's got fresh seed in. You know, green chilies and cilantro, lime zest. It's it's so good. So Seymour is um, a, a plant-ish. We can get into what that means. Sausage company, my word's not them. <laughs> but I've received this sausage, um, as I said, and it is really delicious. It is hot as you're going to get. Okay, that one, yeah. <laughs> that one. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Not all of them. There's flavors like broccoli melt, chicken parm, chicken soup, and then this chicken chili verde. But first, let's back up a little bit. We, we can get to the, the how the sausage is made. Pun is mm-hmm. is terrible, and joke <laughs> is even worse. So, um, but let's get to the your story. Let's talk about some early memories growing up. You are from a butcher family. You come yes. from Boston. Yes. Talk about what it's like around the holidays, because I feel like butchers are so busy in the holidays. Yeah. But then once you know X X Miss comes, it's like time to celebrate. Yeah. What's it like? I mean, I think, well, so first of all, I'm fourth generation in my family um, as far as butchery goes. It skipped a generation in between me and my grandpa, Seymour, who the company is named after. Um, But so I really was raised in the meat industry. And I think people always assume that we, like, do the holidays bigger than everybody else. (laughs) But the truth, the real truth is that, like, we basically got kind of the leftovers that were left in the shop. Like, I remember one year... My grandpa, one of his best customers, she somehow like forgot to get her turkey for Thanksgiving and she got a frozen one. She couldn't defrost it in time. And he gave her our family turkey. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And so we ended up like roasting a couple of chickens and it was fine. But um, for the most part, you know, butchers are working on holidays. Um, I never, ever had days off from the holidays when I was working as a butcher. So that we know how to cook the meat, but I think our... <laughs> yeah, I got a sense of that too. When I, I in my old neighborhood in, in Brooklyn and Borham Hill, there's a place called Staubitz and I used to get meat there and then the line was two and a half hours long. Yep. So I'm thinking about the poor butcher having to work all through the holidays. Yeah. So you're um, pretty exhausted when it comes to like Christmas Day. Totally exhausted. But it was always really f- like a fun push um, yeah. when I was working in in shops, there was always a sense of camaraderie around the holidays that I really loved. Um, I mean, it was certainly high stress because most of the time meat is like the centerpiece of a holiday meal. So people were definitely like anxious about impressing their in-laws and all kinds of things. And mm-hmm. people could get kind of nasty sometimes. But like the people I was working with, we were all like all in it together, and it was uh, very fun. Yeah, super convivial job, I can imagine. Yeah. So, Car, tell me, you know, you mentioned how it skipped a generation. Was there ever a doubt though that you would be a butcher in your life? 
oh yeah, I never <laughs> thought I would do this. <laughs> really? No, I really, I mean, I, I would say out of my sisters and my cousins, I was always like the most curious about what was going on at the shop, but my grandpa really did not want any of us to do this. My grandpa had, it's on my mother's side, he had three daughters. I think he sort of assumed that it would end with him, and he wasn't really very happy when I decided to go into it. <laughs> um, but, he, you know, he's come around to it now. He's 92. He's like our biggest inspiration and cheerleader. Um, but yeah, I, I never thought I would do this. I, I moved to New York like 17 years ago to study Victorian literature and Latin. Like, mm-hmm. I did as you not, will. As yeah, you will. exactly. Yeah. You know, graduated in 2008, right when the entire economy collapsed, and was like, great, I have a degree in Latin. I can, like, I can translate the Aeneid, and that's all I can do. But you ended up around that time joining on at the Meat Hook. I did, yeah. Which you were a founder there. I was there from, yeah, from from early days. Um, So I had been working in restaurants really to pay my way through school, and it kind of ignited an interest in meat for me. I was frustrated seeing kind of all the waste that I was seeing in meat prep in restaurants. Um, It had been, like, so banged into my head from such an early age that like you don't waste anything um my great grandpa used to go and inspect the scrap buckets at the end of the day in the cut room and sort of hold them up and say like you this could have been fajitas this could have been this and that and like with a few expeditions like thrown in there maybe exactly (laughs) no he was so sweet Yeah, yeah um but yeah so i i kind of was like well i want to figure out how to help people do this better i walked around my neighborhood asking all these like old butchers if I could have an apprenticeship and they were like no absolutely not what? Um, they which, wouldn't let you why no. why Be- because if you're a woman was it that or was it just like they didn't want to pass it on to another no. person uh, you know I'm not sure I mean I think I like to think about if if a young girl had ever come in to my grandpa's shop he would have said no too probably and yeah not because he didn't think that they were equipped but because he probably would just have envisioned something else for them um, but I remember I walked over to the meat hook and Brent was there. I was baking at the time at Pies and Thighs. And oh, shout out. Yeah. Whoa, what an awesome, man, best fried yes. chicken in Brooklyn. Easy. <laughs> and uh, I walked up and said to Brent, like, I'm wondering if you ever do apprenticeships. They had just opened. And he was like, sure, yeah, you can come in tomorrow. And it was just like such a breath of fresh air. Um and I did. I would go in in my off hours. Baking hours are usually really early. So I'd go sometimes after shifts or between shit, whatever, and work there for like a year for free. Uh, and then and then came on full time and was there for like five years. I had to bring up Meetup because it is um, a real landmark event in, in Brooklyn food history, I mm-hmm. think. Absolutely. You know, when you're looking at the way that Better Meat has been presented in the past decade and you look at the decade prior you know, it is a, a there's a huge gulf. And at the point in 2008, 2009, when you were there, very much a face of the meat hook, uh, we didn't know about buying meat. We didn't yeah. know about whole animal butchery as a as a customer. And I think I'd like to hear a little bit about the way in your six years there that the uh, the IQ of the meat buyer changed, because I think the meat hook, great name, really iconic place, really meant a lot for New York. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think what they did was really groundbreaking. And I think part of... You did. Yeah. <laughs> you did. Let's be uh, we, clear. We did. Yeah, exactly. Um, and part of what we worked on was, and didn't even work on it, it just kind of came naturally, but was the tone um, mm-hmm. and, and how we spoke to people about good meat and the, you know, the movement of whole animal, the movement of local, all of that stuff. Because I think there is this sort of like elitism that sometimes comes with the better meat movement um, that really alienates people. And I just think we've, we kind of figured out a way to talk to people that didn't make them feel bad and made them feel like they were a part of something. And I think that was really revolutionary. And I think it was also a revolutionary that we were all figuring it out at the mm-hmm. same time too. Like we were all learning together. We were all like sort of at the same level, like butchery and cooking wise and we were like making it up as we went along. It was really fun um, and terrifying. And it was, you know, some of the funnest days of my life, really. That's great. Those memories are there. And I think yeah. I've, I went to a lot of events in that space where there's multiple food businesses. And I hope there would be a great documentary to like, trace back the history of that. I hope yeah. it's done. Yeah, me too. That would be great. Uh, Cara, tell me uh, and our listeners, I'm sure, are wondering, how do you know if a butcher shop is any good? How can you judge it, like face value? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're 
going to a butcher shop to buy your meat, you're probably already doing a good job. Certainly there are different levels, but yeah, I think if you're if you're already seeking out sort of like a separate place to buy your meat, that's a good start because less hands are touching that mm-hmm. meat and there's a traceability there that um, is easier than a supermarket. You know, like if you go to the supermarket and you see a package, like a cryo-packaged steak that they cut, you don't know wh- where it was cut, when it was cut, anything. You, there's really no one to ask. So I would say it's, you're already at a good starting place if you're going mm-hmm. if you're going to a butcher shop. Um, Fair enough. I mean, yeah. is there um, is there like a cut in the in the case that I'm I'm looking for in this in this butcher shop that you think is really emblematic of a good butcher shop? Yeah, I mean, I think once you start seeing cuts that you d- don't normally see, yeah, um, there's a there's a a steak that's basically the calf muscle on the cow that you would never cut ever unless you were breaking a a whole animal. Like, you'd never be getting boxes of those in. So if you see a Merlot steak, if you see an oyster steak, um, probably they're at least getting whole rounds and breaking them. That's a good litmus test for if they're getting beef or not. With pork, a secreto, which Mm -hmm. is basically um, the pork skirt, also good. But, you know, there, there are certainly places that are still getting boxed meats that are doing better than, like, the average uh, supermarket. Supermarket. And yeah. let's talk about supermarkets. Because mm-hmm. on the flip side, oftentimes we don't have a butcher shop nearby and we're in a pinch. So I'm at my shop, right? And I'm like looking in that case and I'm kind of like, okay, I'm going to have meat tonight. I, I want to cook something. I saw, I just bought a cookbook that asked for um, something like a, we'll say a braise, like a, like a shoulder of some sort. Mm-hmm. How do I know um, if it's worth even buying? Is there anything I can do in the shop, right? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, it's sort of the same way that you're looking for a, a when you're looking at a butcher shop, you're looking at like less hands touching that. I've, when I'm looking in a shop where I don't know the origins of something, just from like a, a health and cleanliness perspective, I'm generally looking for larger whole muscles um, because they've been less manipulated, less touched. So smart. Really yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So like if you see a whole chicken, it's always smarter to buy that and break it down yourself than breasts because or legs or whatever. Um, because, yeah, less hands have touched it. It's been less manipulated, less less bacteria on it. But I mean, I'm a big proponent of like, if you go to a store and you think the meat looks not so good and you don't feel good about it, don't buy meat. Like, it's okay. You could buy a can of beans. If you go to the gas station and buy a can of beans and make a beautiful bean dip instead for your friends, like, we'll all survive (laughs) if we don't have meat one night. Um, Yeah, We could open up that can of beans because it's like we could talk about the the butcher telling you not to buy meat in that (laughs) meme. And I think that's obviously really important. and, And I love the idea of less meat consumption in general, right? That's that's really important right now. Yeah, I mean, I think it was something that I really started playing with when I started the Meat Hook because what I noticed was that my customers were coming back, you know, seven days a week. They were getting so much meat. And it got to the point where we were really having trouble keeping up with de- the demand. Um, and I just, I didn't want to see quality go by the wayside so that we could keep up. Um, so I remember kind of toying with, my customer trying to find ways to get my customers to eat like a little bit less. I remember putting veggie burgers in the case at one point, which was like (laughs) I got made so much fun of. And I (laughs) don't think I sold a single one. Um, Nobody (laughs) wanted them and actually noticed this weird psychological thing that would happen where like when I would push people towards the veggie burger, they would end up buying more meat than they were like originally uh, intending to. And so I, I pivoted and started putting vegetables into the sausages I was making. And that was sort of my solution to it. But it was less about getting people to eat less meat and and more about getting the meat that we were using to stretch further to more, to more people at a price point that made sense. So, you know, I think the movement now of like less meat is important. If we lessen our demand for meat, maybe farmers can catch up. Yeah. And and we can sort of implement um, regenerative agriculture across the board and all of those really good things that have all sorts of promise. Mm-hmm. It's um, a halo effect, absolutely. Yeah. Which leads us to Seymour because mm-hmm. when I when I first heard about the company, you know, it's very clear that these are these sausages are thirty five percent vegetables, which is a metric that I've never really thought about personally. Yeah. So I want to know um, what does that mean exactly when you're adding 
way more vegetables than most traditional sausages, which mm-hmm. I would imagine is mostly meat. Yes. So what's this um, end result? I can give you my feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, it's effing delicious. So that's, <laughs> that's for sure. And not, you're not really compromising flavor. But really, what are you doing there? What's the food science? What's mm-hmm. the culinary kind of aptitude happening there? Yeah, um, I, I love that question because it's not – I don't think that people generally realize that it is scientifically a really difficult thing to do. Yes. Um, wa- the, the sort of long and short of it is that water is essentially the the enemy of protein extraction, which is meat binding. So um, vegetables are really just water. They're just fancy, pretty water. Um, so when you're adding them at that amount to a sausage, um, it's going to interrupt that protein extraction and bind and sort of cause like a mushier, softer sausage. Sometimes it won't bind at all. So when you're looking at a sausage that's in the grocery store that's like you know, spinach and feta or something like that. That's all dried vegetables and it makes up maybe 1% of the total. So when we're adding this many vegetables, it means that it means all kinds of things. And I can't say too much because we have all these people snapping at our heels, but all (laughs) all kinds of things go into um, consideration, whether it's dice size, cooking temperature, um, the cut that we use, actually less so now, Mm -hmm. the cut that we use, but salt percentage, um, all of that kind of stuff. The vegetables themselves are important, looking into their water content and how they'll react. But um, we're also doing it in a way that's natural, so we're not using like phosphates or anything like that. So it's flavor enhancers, things that might boost the flavor profile of the of the meat or, or, no, or change it. Yeah, no, and um, it's it's definitely difficult. It definitely took me about a decade of doing it in shops to really crack the code and figure out what I need to be looking for. And then I spent well over a year, you know, in our co-man kind of training them up on on how to make them and what to look for. Um, I mean, my biggest goal is to appeal to like the most hardcore meat eater. Because I mean, I think we eat meat and vegetables together all the time. Like it's a natural thing that we do. So that's part of the reason that the sausages are kind of like a meal in a casing. Absolutely. I mean, I have to say my first instinct is this is going to be very mealy. And the mm-hmm. texture is going to be all off if you're at 35 yeah. percent vegetables. When I when I when I got the release, I think back it would be a year and a half ago about the company. I was like very skeptical. Yeah, of course. Truly, but really, see more, check it out. This isn't paid or anything. <laughs> I just wanted to call you in because it's a cool company and a great tasting sausage. Yeah, um, flavor is really really important. We're seeing. I mean, blended was not a category that it existed when I started doing this, and now like you know all the major players are doing it. They're doing it with plant-based proteins mostly, like mixing traditional meat with plant-based proteins, which I don't think tastes as good. I don't think Definitely the mouthfeel is as good. And I and I also don't think the like traceability of ingredients is as good. So big question here. Off script I, I say it's much <laughs> advanced, but I wanna I just it came to mind. Does the Beyond Burger movement, now Beyond Pork movement, help or hurt you? You know, I would say this past year and a half in the pandemic, I would say I'm very excited about the plant-based movement because I see it as sort of like something you can do besides meat sometimes. But what I'm not excited about is talking about it as the solution, the only solution. Um, because I think when we when we talk about anything as the only solution, it never goes well. It's like just like me trying to get people to eat veggie burgers, they ended up eating more meat. We're eating more meat than ever, even though Beyond and Impossible are getting all this this uh, media attention and frankly all the investment. I mean, it is insane in the investment landscape. Everybody wants it on plant based. I mean, they're on jerseys of NBA teams now. It's it's I mean, crazy. It, it and, shouldn't be that way. And, it's really crazy. And Beyond, I mean, they're reporting losses. Like they're not. I mean, when you really break apart part the numbers it's like 98 percent of the people that are buying those plant-based products are meat eaters and they're only buying those products like four times a year so for me it's just more about like how do we actually turn the dial in like a re- realistic way i fully agree the absolutist sentiment around these products as the pure replacement is is false and and feels really icky i would highlight and recommend alicia kennedy's writing mm-hmm. about uh the beyond movement and and some of the skepticism and research she's done read her her newsletter it's excellent i would love that i did a podcast with her once. Oh, you did. She's yeah. excellent. She's yeah. a she's a really a great thinker for all all things in food. But if you want to really get some information about Beyond, I would highlight uh, her uh, her newsletter uh, from the desk of Alicia Kennedy. 
I want to hear though about the the business side of it because you bring it up about the way that the the investment is going towards uh, beyond and maybe not towards baby brands and smaller food brands. So yeah. what's it like hacking it out in this world of where there's grocery stores that have 10,000 SKUs, it's impossible to get penetration into Whole Foods. Yeah. So first question is, what's that like? Second question is, how can we buy your products? Yeah, um, the answer to the first question is, <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Um, it's so hard. It's, it's so much harder than I ever could have prepared myself for. Uh, we had a tremendously successful first year despite literally launching two weeks before the pandemic shut everything down. Um, And we launched with Whole Foods as an anchor partner into four regions. So we're all over California and we're in the Northeast and the North Atlantic. Whole Whole Foods, Foods. great. Um, yeah, we're, we also just launched with Impossible Foods, or sorry, Imperfect Foods. Oh my God, you like, got in my head. Yeah. <laughs> no, Imperfect Foods. Okay. <laughs> imperfect Foods. Um, and we have a D2C business. So we're in yeah. lots of little independents, but we, we also sell on our website. That's excellent. And then um, how do you grow as a company with uh, the current grocery land? Like, how can you get into Kroger? Or yeah. do you want to even be in Kroger? Yeah, I would love to be in Kroger. I mean, really, my. My goal is to be mass market right. because I want to grow to the point where our price point goes down, but our quality doesn't. And mm-hmm. I can get this good meat to people at a good price point. Um, I think that the better for you aisle is just, you know, there's kind of no fun in that aisle. And I really want to be <laughs> that that fun and sort of yeah. culturally relevant brand in that aisle. Um, so that is definitely the goal. It is so hard. It costs so much money. Like, you know, they'll come to you and say, we really want you on our shelves. And then they're like, it's $20,000 per SKU to oh get, you know, and it's just like, when, you know, we're tiny. When are we going to break even on that? So Ugh. it's, uh, it takes a lot of money to succeed in the meat world. I mean, I imagine in the grocery world, meat's all I know, but. Um, it's grocery in general. We'll get into that in taste. We're working on a couple yeah. of stories based on, on grocery. Um, you, I mean, it is fun. You've got Bubby's Chicken Soup yeah. as one of your flavors. That's super fun. Yeah, and I I feel like when you're looking at meat in general, it's like there's sort of two camps, and, and one is like the better for you, and it's sort of like save the world, and, and then the other one is like KFC and Taco Bell, and they're kind of like, we don't care, do whatever you want. <laughs> and KFC and Taco Bell are the ones that have all that cultural clout, um, you know, that are selling, you know, merch, and people are lining up for their chicken sandwich, and but they are also making you sick, so... You know, we want to have fun with our customers, but also give them a product that's... It's a real a needle thread situation, yeah. fun and, and righteousness and, and responsibility. Yeah. I buried the lead with this interview, but you're, you're a, a very talented writer. Oh, like, thanks. I, I, I forget this. And you wrote a memoir. I did, yeah. I wrote um, a, sort of a, a food and literature memoir called Voracious. And it, it's sort of about, you know, great meals and literature and, and um, my experience when I was reading those books and... Um, all of those things. It feels like a different lifetime. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a minute ago. Um, are you doing your writing right now? Only for myself. Uh, I don't have a ton of time, but one of the things I'm working towards most is having the time to write again. I miss it a lot. So we ask all guests in the Taste Podcast, if you could write a cookbook without time or budget really being a factor, what would that cookbook be? Gosh, I mean, I have a couple of answers to this. I'm trying to think of which one is the most palatable. You can have two. It's totally cool. (laughs) Well, I would say something I've always really wanted to explore is sausages uh, sort of across the world. I mean, they're they're literally the one of the oldest human made foods. They're really the first sustainability minded foods, whether people knew that that's why they were doing it or not. And every single culture has one. So I would love to explore, you know, travel and and eat everyone's sausage um, and write about it. And I think that would be so fun. Um, I think it says a lot about a culture, what their sausage recipe is. Yeah. So I think it's that's interesting. I mean, I think something that I'm thinking a lot about right now is grief and eating, not to like brr, bring the yeah. food down. But yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, the, I launched this business um, right when my sister was diagnosed with cancer. In the last couple of months, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. So really, the whole genesis of this company has been wrapped up in grief. Um, and I've, I've it found it really interesting the way that it affects how I think about food and feeding people and eating. So that's something that I would love to have the, the time and space to explore. Well, thank you, Cara, for sharing that. I really hope to read all of these yes. works <laughs> in these books. And 
Thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Today, Matt and I are sitting down to talk about a big subject. I might even say it's like sort of a controversial subject in the office. It's something we've like gone back and forth and argued about over the years. Chicken soup. Big, big topic. Matt, what do you picture when you sort of think of like just chicken soup, the phrase? First associations. Anna, I have a couple ideas here. We do talk about it a lot in the office because it is one of our most beloved foods or detested foods, depending on who you are, if you're you or you are me. Uh, I think that if you're going to look at like the, the chicken soup emoji, if there was such a thing, I had to look that up. There is not. There's a steaming uh, bowl of noodles emoji, but not a chicken soup emoji yet. Okay. Um, but if you were to say the chicken soup emoji in, in American culture, I would say the predominant idea is likely a a french version of of chicken soup which uses um a mirepoix uh, a standard base of of vegetables and herbs and a boiling of the chi- of the of the chicken without noodles or rice um oftentimes served when um when you're sick right yeah totally i mean i sort of picture like the campbells like um there's noodles in there. There are like little cubes of celery and carrot. And that's kind of like the simplicity. Yeah, the simplicity is um, is really what we as uh, Americans or as, as white Americans think about. But as we'll get into, there's so much more going on in the world of chicken noodle soup. I was also going to add my personal connection to chicken soup. My father made chicken soup often on Sundays um, while the Detroit Lions, I'm from West Michigan, a theme here on the podcast, when the Detroit Lions were playing, he would make chicken soup. Oftentimes, we would eat the chicken soup after a loss. That's so interesting because I don't think of chicken soup as a sports meal at all. Um, But it's funny that it was sort of like a consolatory uh, soup. Yeah, uh, we 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 suffered through many bowls after our losses to to like the Packers or the Bears. Just saying. Last fall, Kathy Irway wrote a piece for Taste um, that takes sort of like a wide view of chicken soup and like this idea that it's something we eat when we're sick or when we're maybe like feeling sad or under the weather. Um, and she sort of looks at a whole bunch of cultures that treat chicken broth or chicken soup as this sort of like curative thing. And it's interesting because it's like something that culturally we eat as a comfort food to make us feel better. But scientifically, there's not much there that proves that it's good for you if you have a cold. Yeah, I feel like the the Chicken Soup for the Soul book publishers um, want you to think that there's some kind of um, chemical balance that's happening when you're when you're drinking warm broth. But Alas, there is very little scientific proof, but I loved Kathy's story, um, which got into a lot of the different riffs of chicken soup around the world. Riffs is a word I hate using. I don't know why I just said it. Uh, riff spins tips and tricks. No, I think it's it's a global cuisine. And um, she writes about, um, you know, pho in the chicken form, uh, samgetang, which uh, is the Korean chicken soup that has ginseng and jujubes and is uh, stuffed rice so the carcass of the chicken is stuffed with glutinous rice and um, it's a totally different way of thinking about it if you're coming from a, again that white american point of view of the, the the european french version but equally amazing and in korea the samgetang is often um, consumed in the summertime uh, and we've written about that as well on taste and we'll put that in the show notes um, about how uh, this chicken soup, samgyetang, is is used to cool you and energize you during those hottest days of summer. I love that because it's. I think of chicken soup as such a wintry thing, like a cozy comfort food, but it's really for all times of the year. One of my favorite chicken soups is um, from a Guatemalan restaurant in my neighborhood called Ish, spelled I X. And actually, Kathy, in her article, spoke to the owner of Ish um, about sort of his technique for making chicken broth. But the soup that I love in particular from Ish is a soup called Hokon, and it's like a really, really delicious chicken broth with some like threads of chicken meat in there. And it's sort of like 
um, thickens and turn green with lots of tomatillo and cilantro. There's nothing better on like a cold blizzardy day in Brooklyn than stopping into Ish for a bowl of hokone. It's awesome. It sounds so good. I've I've not been there, Anna, and, and thanks for bringing that that place up because I I feel like that's just yet another example of how chicken soup can be is made around the globe. Um, I really want to know though, how do you make chicken soup at home? Do you have a preferred method? So I'm always saving my chicken bones, like a lot of people. It's like a a free extra um, bonus material you get after roasting a chicken. So I like to just, you know, now that we're working from home a lot, I like to just set a pot of water with chicken bones on the stovetop, throw in some onions, garlic, peppercorns, bay leaves, carrots, celery, kind of like whatever I have around. Parmesan, I love to just, if I buy a nice kind of like little wedge of Parmesan, when I get to the end of it, just the rind, I just throw that in the freezer in like a Ziploc bag or a little um, like sealable plastic container and throw that in any chicken broths I'm making. And it adds like a little bit of saltiness, but also kind of like a nice savory note. And it's like a cool thing to make out of basically garbage. <laughs> yeah, I know totally like you would be throwing those away if not. And then you can add like things like like fennel, rosemary and onions too to give it that kind of northern italian vibe yeah totally and and you can do kind of whatever you want with it what do you like to make when you're making a chicken broth or a chicken soup at home you know i i'm not a huge maker of chicken soup to be honest and i i gotta say um all those bowls of lions uh lost chicken soup kind of is triggering so i i really i don't make it all the time um but what I what I do do is I read about chicken soup often. We edit stories, as I've mentioned, and I feel like um, I live through um, other uh, more more skilled and seasoned chicken soup uh, chefs out there. So I did a little research, and I wanted to get into like some ideas from a couple of folks. Sola Alwali was doing this series of, of of really cool videos with Food Fifty Two, and I think the last one she did was about chicken soup. And I just wanted to bring this little nugget in that Anna, did you know that there is a difference between stock and broth I, I did not know this i don't know why i never thought about this i think somewhere in the back of my head maybe i knew that at some point um but tell me what's the difference so stock is just the bone so stock is like kind of how you were talking about how you make it the broth is when the meat is attached to the bone she also makes the note that today in 2021 22 there really isn't um, a difference. So I thought it was a little bit of a hedge there from her, but I thought that was really good information. So it's more of like an almost culinary school difference where people talk about it in like a technical sense. Totally. And this leads to David Chang's version, which um, he details in uh, in this book, Cooking at Home, that he wrote with Priya Krishna. We had Priya on the podcast a few episodes ago. You can check that out. Um, I really like this technique because it actually combines... A little bit of the stock approach with the broth approach. So let me, you want me to walk walk us through a little of this David Chang method? I felt it's worth sharing. Yeah, totally. And I think his book even has like a few different ways to customize. If you like have, have a giant pot of chicken broth and you don't want to get bored with it over the course of a week. Indeed, it's absolutely that. So what he does is this is like really simple. He takes a full chicken that you're going to buy like a roaster and he kind of boils the shit out of it. Like he really boils it for 45 minutes. He then removes the bird and cools it and pulls the meat off of the bird. Pulls it, pulls it, pulls it. Gets it all into a nice pile. He then, if you want a clear broth, you got, that's your broth there. It's like, it's like sitting right there. It's just your broth is ready. Or you can put the bones back into it. Just like the carcass of the bones that you've pulled off of and add it back into the stock or the broth we're calling it or it's going from broth to stock and you're boiling it for a few more minutes and i thought that was a good idea to like do the pull and then you've got this carcass back in and while that's kind of that, that second boil is happening you're doing something with that pile of chicken you're like actually manipulating it you're you're using it as like the base for your soup so he has a couple kind of directions with that pile of chicken one of them is to simply Season that chicken with sesame oil and black pepper. 
no salt, just sesame oil, really good sesame oil and black pepper. You put it all back into the into the broth, into it. You, you pull the bones out, and you've got yourself a really nice, like an East Asian style chicken soup there. That sounds delicious. That actually reminds me of another Kathy Irway article for Taste. Kathy's kind of our resident chicken expert. She has a, a chicken column for Taste. She wrote about this amazing um, chicken salad that she likes to just put on buns as to have as a sandwich. But she does a similar thing where she poaches raw chicken, uses the meat for the chicken salad, and then you wind up with this really beautiful broth that you can do whatever you want with. Yeah, I love that story. It's great. And I feel like you can definitely let that cool down and do a lot of cool things with that poached chicken. Um, one other thing Chang uh, writes about and Priya write about in their book is kind of this this kind of uh, – it was like a Chinese-Korean style, but it's more – it's like based around – you're basically taking your, your chicken, you're putting it back into the broth, and you're adding this kind of sauce that you've created with Szechuan peppercorns, gojujan, fennel seed – and then you're serving it with rice or noodles. And then he kind of segues into this whole idea of the chicken noodle soup versus the chicken soup. Definitely worth checking out that book, Cooking at Home. Awesome. I love that. Check out our program notes for some links to read more about chicken soup and to get some ideas for your own soup making this season. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Our theme music is by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.